November 21st, 1902. Like the sailors of the salt seas, the men who navigate the inland waters are a superstitious lot. Almost every wreck that marks the history of the lakes is the inspiration of some weird fantastic story that by frequent repetition assumes the dignity of truth in the sailor's ready mind. One such superstition that is firmly rooted in the minds of all Great Lakes navigation concerns the mysterious wreck of the steamer Bannockburn. She had been launched nine years prior to her disappearance in 1893 and had quite an unusual profile for a freighter. On her voyages hauling grains for the Montreal Transportation Company, captains from other ships could recognize the Bannockburn before they could even read her nameplate. The ship had become a common sight on the Great Lakes. The Bannockburn was 245 feet long, 40 feet wide, 1,620 gross tons, and was regarded as entirely seaworthy. She sometimes had one or two barges in tow, but on this, her last trip, was coming down alone. She had a cargo of 100,000 bushels of wheat when she left Port Arthur on the 21st, and as the season was advanced, it is probable that this was consigned to a Georgian Bay port. The Bennett Burn disappeared without a trace sometime after 11 p.m. on November 21st. At that late date in November, there would not be many vessels trading into Port Arthur or Fort Williams, which would be likely to see the Bennettburn as she headed towards the Sioux. But about a week later, the press carried a dispatch quoting Captain James McMahon of the steamer Algonquin as having seen the missing Bennettburn on the 21st while headed up the lake. His statement was that, at a point about 50 miles southeast of Passage Island and northeast of Kiwina Point, Running against a strong headwind, he had sighted a vessel, which he believed was the Bannockburn. She appeared to be running well with a favorable wind, but when he looked for her a few minutes later, she had disappeared. The weather was hazy at the time, and he supposed that she had gone from sight in the mist. He remarked to his first officer that the vessel had vanished very quickly. The records of the Canadian ship canal show that the Algonquin passed up at 1 p.m. on the 20th, which, with an average running time, would place her in the position mentioned. If the Bannockburn left Port Arthur early on the morning of the 21st, she would be somewhere in the vicinity of the point where the Algonquin claimed to have seen her. The run from Port Arthur should have been made in 30 hours under ordinary conditions, and the boat was thought to be nearly halfway on her journey when the fierce westerly gale set in. Accompanying these gales was considerable snow, which greatly increased the dangers of navigation. There was at the time, and has been since, much speculation as to the fate which overtook the vessel. A rumor current at the time was that the boat was carrying flaxseed, a dangerous shifting cargo. However, there is no evidence that the cargo was other than wheat. The possibility of having run upon Superior Shoal was also mentioned though this would require the vessel to be off course. Superior Shoal was, as yet, not marked on charts unless added by captains themselves. There was a slim chance that the steamer ran back and found shelter under Isle Royale, or even that she became disabled and was now lying at some inaccessible and remote point along the northeast coast of Lake Superior. Her owners and the relatives of the crew had hoped that the latter was the case, as they believed that had the boat been put back to Isle Royale, she would have been heard of long ago. Six days late, and with no new news received regarding the Bannockburn, the tugs General and Boynton were set out along the northeast coast in search of her at a cost of $250 per day each. They left the Sioux with instructions to go around Michipicoten Island, then on to the Caribou Island area, following the North Shore up to Isle Royale, return by the North Shore to a point opposite Whitefish Point, and come home by the South Shore. No trace of the missing vessel was discovered. Eventually, the underwriters came to the conclusion that the Bannockburn had stranded on Caribou Island. This island is surrounded by a dangerous reef, and its lighthouse had been intentionally turned off on November 15th. 
If the captain of the Bannockburn had been hoping to spot its warning light in the darkness of the storm on the 21st, the only evidence he would have had of its closing proximity would have been the shock of the hull striking the reef itself. On Friday, December 12th, the captain of the Grand Marais life-saving station found a cork life preserver from the Bannockburn washed up on the beach. This item is the only known wreckage from the ship ever to have been recovered. Captain Wood from Port Dalhousie, Ontario, was the oldest person aboard the vessel at age 37. Most of the crew were between the ages of 17 and 20. His first mate, Alex Graham, was also from Port Dalhousie, Ontario. One of the ship's two wheelsmen, Arthur Callaghan, was only 16. Although the ship was considered to be of recent manufacture, at nine years old it was still thought of as almost new. The overall inexperience of her crew might have been a factor in her being lost. Such young crews, however, were common on the Great Lakes at the turn of the 20th century because they were inexpensive to hire and shipping firms had strong financial incentives and no legislative reason not to take advantage of this whenever they might. What's interesting about the Bannockburn is the fact that she had three major incidents before she disappeared. In April 1897, the ship ran aground on the rocks near Snake Island Light. Even though no lives were lost, she was badly damaged. Several months later, in October 1897, on her way to Kingston carrying grain, she struck the wall of the Welland Canal and took nine feet of water. On November 20th, 1902, one day before her final voyage, the ship ran aground shortly after leaving Fort William and turned back to port. Having suffered no apparent damage, the Bannockburn recommenced her journey on November 21st, 1902, and the story unfolds as was just told. There was a rumor that the steamer Rockefeller had found some wreckage, but they did not stop to check the debris so no one knows if it was from the Bannockburn. A story out of St. Catharines, Ontario on March 27th, 1905, said that a large piece of steel, evidently from the bottom of a vessel, was found in the New Welland Canal. It may solve the mysterious loss of the steamer Bannockburn with all on board in Lake Superior in the fall of 1903. The Bannockburn was the only steel vessel to pass through the canal, and it is believed that the piece of hull was lost on the steamer's last trip, weakening the Bannockburn so that she foundered on Lake Superior. The story doesn't quite end there. The Bannockburn is supposed to be the Flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes. Sometimes at night, when the chill north wind sweeps across the swollen bosom of Lake Superior and the stinging ice devils fill the air, the lookout on some lonely point calls loudly to his companion and points to where he imagines the Bannockburn, all white with ice and ghostly in the darkness, is slipping through the black mystery of the lake. Easily identifiable by her profile, it's hard to mistake it for another ship. While some of the sightings are clearly just stories, others are not that easy to dismiss and have been reported in regional newspapers. One such story was that of the ore freighter Walter A. Hutchinson, shortly after World War II. When the crew saw the Bannockburn just a hundred yards away coming straight at them, the captain tried to put some distance between the Walter A. Hutchinson and the Bannockburn and steered to the northeast. The Bannockburn went past Walter A. Hutchinson safely, only to run aground and disappear. If the captain of the Walter A. Hutchinson hadn't changed course, the ship could have easily been destroyed by the rocks. The Bannockburn story was covered in many newspapers at the time. The information here came from the Daily Kennebec Journal, March 28, 1905, The Evening Times Republican, December 15, 1902, The Evening Times Republican, November 27, 1902, The Mount Holly News, September 25, 1917, The New York Tribune, July 29, 1917, The St. Paul Globe, November 27, 1902, the Evening Bulletin, November 28, 1902, Wikimedia Commons, and The Morning Call, September 20, 1893.
This is a Country Road production because history is fascinating.